may have noticed that there is no bulletin for you to grab on your way in to guide your worship this morning. That is because our beloved church admin, Trish Erickson, is on vacation overseas for two weeks and we wanted to experiment to see how the church is impacted by the bulletin. Please utilize, please utilize the screens behind me for the order of worship. Trish will return at the end of the week. Please keep her and her family who are traveling together in your prayers. The deacons are now accepting food donations for this year's blessing boxes. You will find a sign-up sheet in the hallway outside the sanctuary and another one in the podium in the church reception area. The deadline to drop off donations is November 6th. We will be blessing the boxes in worship on Sunday, November 10th. Thank you for being generous. We are just one week away from our annual October Kirken of the Tartans, a Scottish-themed worship service which honors the roots of the Presbyterian Church. It will be held on Sunday, October 27th at 10.30 a.m. here in the church sanctuary. The St. Andrew's Society Royal Honor Guard will be here, as, as will by a piper David Martin. Please bring a piece of fabric or item that represents your family, such as your family's tartan, to bring forward for the family blessing during the service. You are welcome, as always, to invite friends and relatives to attend. Children are also very welcome. Reverend Dr. Charles Hardwick, the Synod Executive of the Synod of the Covenant, will be here to lead worship on that day. After the service, the piper will pipe us all down to the potluck meal in the Church Fellowship Hall. There is a sign-up sheet in the church reception area to designate what you plan to bring. If you plan to bring something and have not already signed up, please do so. This will help to ensure that we have a balance and variety of the food. Stewardship Sunday will be here soon. Looking for a stewardship mailing, look for a stewardship mailing with a pledge card to arrive in your home by the first week of November. We humbly ask you to pray about it and consider making a pledge and perhaps even increasing your pledge. Costs have gone up for all of us, even churches. Please keep the following people in your prayers this week. John Buell, Larry Crane, Ellen Hoare Fisher, Louis, Lois Nelson, Dorothy Seabrook, Stella Tu, the Stevenson family, and the death of William Stevenson, who grew up in this church. Please also continue to pray for peace and an end to all the wars being fought around the globe. Now let us hear and respond to the call to worship. Praise the Lord, for God is great indeed. Let us sing praises for God's glorious works. We give glory, honor, and thanksgiving to the Lord, who makes and sustains all things. Please rise in body and or spirit for our opening hymn, Be Thou My Vision. <laughs>
beside our neighbor, trusting in the mercy of our Lord. Please join me in the prayer for confession. We pray for forgiveness this day. For choosing power over service, forgive us. For seeking glory rather than humility, forgive us. For pushing ourselves to the front when our presence is needed on the sidelines, forgive us. Help us know where we are needed and how best to serve you and your people. Guide us to pray that we might be your hands of healing and compassion for a world in need. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. People of God, your sins are forgiven, for the Lord who made all things knows our weaknesses. Therefore, turn away from sin and obey the ways of the Lord. Be reconciled to the community in service and love. gives us counsel for our understanding. Enable us to receive it today in the name of your Son, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Old Testament reading today comes from Psalms 91, verses 9 through 16. Hear now the word of God. Because you have made the Lord your refuge, the Most High your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, no scourge come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Those who love me I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. When they call to me I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. With long life I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Today's um, second scripture reading comes from uh, Mark chapter 10, 35 through 45. James and John, the son of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Appoint us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink. With the baptism with which I am baptized you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to appoint, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John, so Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. Instead, whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the word of the Lord. You know, in today's gospel, it's easy to be a little bit, feel a little sorry for James and John, to be honest, because I think they have unnecessarily harsh press throughout the press throughout history because of this passage. They come to Jesus and read their request. Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And then they get no compassion from Jesus, and the rest of the disciples get angry with them. Is the sound okay, by the way? All right. I'm wearing a dress today, and I don't have pockets. This is what it's like to be a female pastor. And in our church, we have two mics, so I certainly don't have two pockets today. All right, is this better? This is better. Yeah, okay. But... So, you know, they they get no compassion from you. They ask, teacher, we want you to do whatever we ask of you. And then they get no compassion from Jesus. They get no compassion from their friends, their disciples, Jesus' disciples. But actually, they're just doing what Jesus told them to do previously. See, a couple, uh, a little while ago in Matthew 7, 7, Jesus says, ask and it shall be given to you. In John, it says, I will do whatever you ask in my name. These might be verses that are much more familiar to you than what we read today. So to be fair to James and John, they must have been a little confused by this entire situation. Jesus says, ask for things. And then when they do, they get told off. Not only do they get told off, they go down through 2,024 years, maybe not exactly, of history as bad, selfish, egotistical people who just wanted to sit at the left and right hand of Jesus. I think it's a little harsh. So I want us to be a little bit fair on James and John and not demonize them as those selfish, arrogant disciples who thought that they were deserving of such a great honor to sit at the left and right hand of Jesus. Instead, they were just doing what Jesus told them to do. Ask for things. Ask 
They were loyally standing with Jesus as he headed towards Jerusalem, and they were just asking for what they felt was right in Jesus' name. And I think it's helpful to see them this way because I think we might be able to better identify with them. The truth is that most times when we ask and pray um, for, to God for things, we aren't being particularly arrogant or selfish or egotistical. We're merely expressing to God what we think we need in this moment for a happy life or expressing what might be helpful in a particular situation. Perhaps what we express is right, perhaps it is wrong, but it's not typically driven by arrogance and selfish ego, and certainly not if you're a member of Gross Point Woods Presbyterian Church. We don't exactly go, Lord, help me win the lottery so that I can go off to the Cayman Islands and hide all my money and travel around the world with no, with no care for the world. We go, Lord, let me win the lottery to support my family, to help my church, to donate to the poor for world peace and be able to do things and travel the world free from entanglements of finance. It's not out of ill will. It's not out of arrogance. However, we read later in the chapter, in verse 41, that the other disciples, their friends, their buddies, mind you, these were probably 17, 18-year-olds, 14, 15, 17, 16. The other disciples were angry with them, but honestly, that's not because their motivations were any different or any purer because they thought that they might have been beaten to the punch for the seats and glory, that they would be missing out for themselves. So when we read Jesus' words by way of response, I don't think he is telling them off, actually. Instead, he might be being gentle with them, and he's using this as a teaching opportunity, as parents do, as teachers do. And he's using this to teach them what is important in the kingdom of God, which is what he has been doing all along, and what he does for the rest of the Gospels. He teaches them, he teaches us, what we need to be reminded of, what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And I think it boils down to two things. First is, to be a Christian means to totally submit ourselves to the will of God. James and John asked for positions of glory for their faithfulness to Jesus. But Jesus says, you don't know what you're asking. And then he draws on two metaphors that they understood. Jesus says, are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Yes. Are you able to be baptized with the water that I'm, the baptism that I'm baptized with? Yes. Well, the cup that Jesus was about to drink was about suffering and death. He prays in Mark's gospel, Lord, take this cup away from me at the Garden of Gethsemane. So Jesus is saying to James and John, I am about to be overcome by this huge, huge calamity in which I will suffer and I will die. Can you go through that? And James and John say, yes. We are able. Could you say that? They have decided to stay with Jesus regardless of what he might suffer. So forget any sense that James and John are to be ridiculed or despised as a result of their selfish request in this passage. Instead, maybe we respect and honor for their courage and loyalty despite knowing that calamity and suffering and death would befall them instead. And in fact, after Jesus dies, we learn that James is the first disciple to be martyred, and later John is sent into exile um, after being tortured by Caesar. So James and John did indeed drink the cup, and they were baptized into suffering, yet without knowing this future that lay ahead of them, they both said, yes, we are able. We can drink from the cup, and we can be baptized 
by the same baptism. In the face of such suffering, it would have been easy for them to walk away. It would have been easy for them to be bitter towards God because he had not given them what they had requested. It would have been tempting for them to be angry with Jesus because he had robbed them of their dreams of glory. But they don't do that. They humbly submit themselves to the will of God, and they say, yes, we are prepared to drink of the cup, baptized by the same baptism, walk the way of Christ at whatever personal cost to themselves. Would you be able to do the same? That can be a tough lesson for us to learn. Sometimes we have spent so long being faithful to God or might have spent so much time and energy on a particular form of ministry that we think, like James and John, we deserve a little bit of a reward from God. And then, when the reward doesn't come or when life gets tough or may may maybe we grow bitter, maybe we grow angry, maybe we are tempted to walk away from faith. We might think, oh, for goodness sake, God, I have given you, given to this church, given to you so much, so long, so much effort. I have given so much offering. I've bought so many gifts for the angel tree. I have done three Thanksgiving boxes all by myself. You can do that, by the way. That's allowed. But as much as we wish it would be otherwise, that is not the way of Christian discipleship. It's not how it works. We are called to submit ourselves totally to the will of God, period. Maybe good things will come our way. Maybe they don't. But our task is to submit and to follow without seeking reward. When we read the gospel stories, there are two who were placed on the left and right hand of Jesus as he was glorified. Do you remember who they were? They were the two thieves that were crucified with him on the cross. And I do not think that that is a coincidence. So Jesus is saying that Christian discipleship is hallmarked by a complete submission to the will of God without the hope of reward. There's a, um, the theme song for Friends is I'll Be There For You, and it goes, I'll be there for you um, when the rain starts to fall. I'll be there for you. How does it go? Blah, 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 blah. The point is, I'm looking at specific people who like friends. Um, it says, I'll be there for you because you're there for me too, right? It is not. Christian discipleship is not because you're there for me too. Christian discipleship is I'll be there for you, period, without hope of reward. Secondly, the life of Christian discipleship is hallmarked by serving others. In verse 43, Jesus says, Whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. Now, this isn't talking about the times when I say, Oh, I will be last because the first shall be last and the last shall be first when I know I'm losing. This is completely countercultural today as it was then. There is a contradiction in terms in verse 42 where Jesus says the Gentile rulers lord it over others in the kingdom of God, but it is impossible to lord it over. Instead, we as Christians lord it under. What I mean is that lordship and authority are shown through servanthood and not through claiming power over people. As Jesus says, in verse 45, for the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And Jesus is making his point really clearly here. He doesn't refer to himself as the Son of God, which may have put him over human beings. Instead, 
he refers to himself as the Son of Man, which is far more servant-like. Jesus' way is not to lord it over us, though he easily could, and he has every right to do so. Jesus' way is to lord it under us. And if we want to be faithful Christians, then we too must constantly seek ways to lord it under others, to serve others, and to put others above ourselves at all times. That is the way of Christ. That is the way of Christian discipleship. When I was in college, there was a, uh, I was a part of a Christian, um, not sorority, group, Christian club called Joy. And it stood for Jesus first, others you, uh, others second, and you, why, you third. That's what Christian discipleship is like. But what does that look like for us today? Maybe Maybe it's not the most efficient way for something to be, be done. Maybe it is the most effective way. What is the end goal? What is the true purpose? Keep the question, why are we doing this with God at the center in mind? This system is not broken. This um, Thanksgiving basket system is not broken. But it might not be the best way to do it when we think of Christian discipleship. To lord it under others is the life to which we are called, that is, and that is what is modeled for us through Jesus himself, who came to give his life as a ransom for many. So this passage from the Gospels is really not about selfish desires, it's not a story that allows us permission to think that James and John are arrogant, self-centered people who were out there to get whatever they could from Jesus and sit at the right and left hand of him. Instead, they are good and honest followers of Jesus who were merely doing what they thought it was all right to do, asking Jesus for anything they wanted as he had instructed them just a little bit ago. But in doing that, Jesus has an important lesson to teach them and to teach us about the nature of Christian discipleship. You see, my friends, being a follower of Jesus is not about reaping rich rewards for having so faithfully, having served him for so many years, or for having been dedicated to his church for a very long period of time, giving of time and money and energy and effort and imagination and creativity and excellence. Christian discipleship is not about reward at all. It's about total obedience to God, to the will of God. Whether that leads to good things or bad things, easy times or hard times, we endure all things in our walk with Christ. And secondly, as disciples, as Christians, we do not lord it over others, but instead we try to find ways to lord it under them. To be a servant and slave of all rather than trying to become an authority figure. That's terrible as I stand here as an authority figure to say that. I did not think of that when I was writing this. But that is the way of Christ. That is the way of Christian discipleship to be servant and slave of all. Let us pray. Lord God, I confess that I am no longer my own but yours, and put to me what you will. Rank me with whom you will. Put me to doing, put me to suffering. Let me be employed for you or laid aside for you, exalted for you or brought low for you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all the things. Let me have nothing. I freely and wholeheartedly yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. Amen. Let us continue worship by singing, Will You Let Me Be Your Servant, which is hymn 727 in Glory to God.
morning we ask that you bring your offerings to this little church on my left either during our um uh, during our la last hymn or um, after worship as you exit it is um, your freedom god is ever faithful and has blessed us with so much and with grateful hearts let us offer back to god what we have with love and thanksgiving and I will continue to today's prayers of the people. Today's prayers of the people is a responsive prayer. And whenever you hear, we pray to the God of light and love. Please respond with, if you are able, loving God, hear our prayer and strengthen our compassion. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, come and inspire us that by the stimulus of Christ we may continue through all our days to grow in the knowledge and love of all that is true and gracious. We pray to the God of light and love, loving God, hear our prayer and strengthen our compassion. That in the power of the Spirit, the people of the church may cherish the faith, share the gospel, and live together in respect trust and peace we pray to the god of light and love loving god hear our prayer and strengthen our compassion that if temptation set upon us we may stand firm and if they afflict or break others we may be agents of your truth and saving mercy we pray to the god of light and love loving god hear our prayer and strengthen our compassion that when others are hurt hungry sick sad misjudged downtrodden or abused that they may find comfort healing justice dignity and joy we pray to the god of light and love loving god hear our prayer and strengthen our compassion that by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the leaders of our city, of our state, and nation, and the world, may lead people away from things that corrupt and dismay. We pray to the God of light and love. Loving God, hear our prayer and strengthen our compassion. That we, with malice towards none and with commitment to the well-being of all, may be stretched to our full potential in Christ's service we pray to the god of light and love loving god hear our prayer and strengthen our compassion we especially ask for your special presence to be with those who could not be with us today for any reason including john buell larry crane ellen horn fisher lois nelson dorothy seabrook stella Chu, and the stevenson family and trish erickson's family we pray to the God of light and love. Loving God, hear our prayer and strengthen our compassion. Now to the Holy One who is able to do much more than we can achieve or even conceive, be in the church through Christ Jesus for this time forth and evermore. And we pray these things in the name of the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us rise if you are able in body or spirit for the final hymn 726, Will You Come and Follow Me? And during this time, if you have the offering, you may come and offer it here, or you can wait until the end of service. <laughs>
the Son of Man came to serve, not to be served. So let us follow Christ's example and give our all to God and to one another. And may the knowledge of love, knowledge and love of the one who knit this earth together and knit you in your mother's womb, rest with you and give you the strength to help others for the glory of God. Amen. Alleluia. Amen. Thank you.